This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one service you can use to build and run your business. What is up, Solo Cups? My name is John Solo, and if that flash of lightning made you jump, then its mission is complete. Because we're officially a week into October, and that means it's spoopy season. Time for pumpkin spice to make its comeback, tortured souls to wander the earth, and just a little bit of Satan worship. Halloween traditions have become some of my favorites in recent years, but you can't deny they're random as hell, like jack-o'-lanterns. Why is it that every year, hundreds of thousands of Americans flock to farms and markets to find the perfect pumpkin to carve Cthulhu's face into? I'll be honest, I've probably carved a dozen or so jack-o'-lanterns in my lifetime, but up until recently, I never stopped and questioned why I was carving them. In my head, it was fall, so that meant pumpkins were in season. And since no one actually wants to eat pumpkin because it's gross, folks just carved them. Well, it turns out I was wrong about two things. One, pumpkin is fantastic, and two, the reasons we carve them are a lot darker than I realized. The tradition of carving jack-o'-lanterns actually started over a thousand years ago in Ireland. And when you consider the name, jack o lanterns, that's almost too obvious in hindsight. But to understand why the Irish made jack-o'-lanterns, I first have to tell you a story about a guy named Stingy Jack. He was a liar, a manipulator, a drunk, and his soul was so black that Satan himself was jealous. So I really think you're gonna like him. We're about to jump right into his story, but for those who enjoy messed up content that changes the way you see the world and want more of it delivered to your sub box every single Thursday, be sure to carve a face into those like and subscribe buttons. And now, without further ado, the messed up origins of jack-o'-lanterns. The first version of Stingy Jack's story that I'm gonna share with you, I'll call the classic version. For the first time, maybe ever, we don't have any folklore collections or even pamphlets to trace it back to, but this was definitely the most common variant that was passed around Ireland back in the day. And if you search for Stingy Jack on Google, this is the version you'll find. So as you already know, Stingy Jack is a manipulative piece of human garbage with no morals or empathy for anyone. If you've seen any of David Dobrik's content, you're familiar with the type. And when Satan hears about Jack's malicious ways and silver tongue, he wants to meet him. One night, Jack is drunkenly staggering his way back home from the bar when up ahead in the middle of the path, he sees a weird shape on the ground. It's dark, so he gets a little closer to investigate, and as the mysterious silhouette comes into focus, he realizes it's a mutilated corpse with an unsettling look on its face. Jack is looking down at the corpse for a few moments when suddenly its eyes move and lock directly onto his. Then its mouth begins to open and a voice comes out claiming to be Satan himself. At this, Jack realizes he's about to be taken to hell, and so he asks Satan to go back to the bar so we can have one last drink. And Satan figures, what's the worst that could happen? So together, they go back to the bar and order enough drinks to kill a man. Well, when the devil says it's time to go, Jack says the least he could do is pay for his drinks. He is taking him to hell after all. The request took Satan off guard, but he saw Jack's point. The only problem was he didn't have any money with him. So Jack says, don't worry about it. Just turn yourself into a silver coin. I'll pay with you. And when the bartender's not looking, you can just transform back. Apparently Satan forgot that dining and dashing was a possibility, so he agreed and turned himself into a coin. Only instead of paying, Jack put the coin into his pocket next to his silver cross, which meant the devil was stuck in his coin form. It wasn't until Satan agreed to give Stingy Jack another 10 years before collecting his soul that he was released. But 10 years of boozing and schmoozing later, Satan returned and went to Jack's house directly to receive what he was owed. Just before the pair started their journey to hell though, Jack had another request. Could the devil please get him an apple out of a nearby tree before they leave. Initially, the devil says absolutely not, but Jack says, come on, you don't want to hear my stomach grumbling the whole journey, do you? So faced with that annoyance, Satan picks what he believes to be the lesser of two evils. Only when he climbs up a nearby tree to get an apple, Jack surrounds it with crosses, which means the devil can't get down. And this time, Jack blackmails him into agreeing to never collect his soul. Now, at first, this seemed like a huge win for Jack. He lived another few years happily conning his way through life until finally the excessive drinking killed him. And when his soul went to heaven, God personally came out of the gates and said, there is no way in hell you're getting in here. At that, Jack's soul was sent down to hell where the devil was eagerly waiting. Jack begged him to open the gate so he'd have some place to go, but the devil said, sorry man, I made a promise to never collect your soul and upholding deals is kind of my thing. This meant Jack had nowhere to go from here and was cursed to spend eternity wandering through the darkness of purgatory, the world between worlds. And the only thing he had to light his way was a parting gift from the devil, a single glowing ember, which he carried using a hollowed out turnip. 
From then on, Stingy Jack was given a new name, Jack of the Lantern, and over time that was shortened to become Jack o' Lantern. The legend says that every year on October 31st, you can actually see the spirit of Jack and his glowing ember wandering aimlessly through the forests and marshes, looking for other souls to join him in his misery. Now there's another version of Stingy Jack's story that I prefer a little more than the classic one. It's a bit more violent and the Trixie poles are a little more elaborate. Before I tell you it though, I should clarify what exactly the folktale has to do with the creation of jack-o'-lanterns besides the name. You see, these stories about Stingy Jack were told a long time ago. I'm talking prior to the year 800. So mankind's belief in spirits, witchcraft, and otherworldly things was at an all time high. As a result, fantastical explanations were thought up to explain natural but incredible incredible phenomena. One example would be Ignis Fatus, more commonly known as Ghost Lights or even more commonly known by fans of Disney's Brave as Will of the Wisp. To put it simply, these are atmospheric, seemingly floating orbs of light that are often seen at nighttime by travelers and people who lived out in the country. They're especially common in wooded and swampy areas. The scientific explanation for them is that gases being emitted by the marshes are igniting in the air and creating a floating flame effect. But back in the 8th century and earlier, people didn't know that, so other causes were thought of. One such cause was Jack of the Lantern. If you looked outside your cottage and saw glowing lights off in the distance, that meant Stingy Jack and other spirits like him were out there searching for helpless souls. And believe it or not, some people actually fell victim to these lights. Weary travelers would sometimes mistake them for torches from a town up ahead, and they were so desperate for shelter, because remember, the lights mainly showed up in environments that were miserable to travel through on foot, that they wouldn't pay attention to where they were going and would end up walking straight into a bog and drowning. After reading this, I couldn't help but think of Lord of the Rings when Sam, Frodo, and Smeagol are traversing the dead marshes, and Frodo is so entranced by the lights that he almost drowns. Methinks Tolkien may have taken some inspiration from these old legends. Gollum? Don't follow the lights. Anyway, to keep the spirits away from them, folks in both Ireland and Scotland would make their own versions of Jack's Lantern by carving scary faces into turnips and placing them near windows to frighten the evil spirits away. And before you say, come on, people really thought turnips were enough to protect them against evil spirits? Just look at one. Yeah, you're gonna see this in your dreams tonight and it's all thanks to me. Now you know how I felt that morning I woke up next to your mother. Now this practice of carving faces wasn't the year-round activity for most people. It was mainly during the Celtic festival of Samhain, which took place on November 1st. But it was believed that on Samhain Eve, October 31st specifically, dead spirits could return to mingle with the living, hence the need for protection. In addition to the face carvings, people would also put on masks and scary costumes when traveling outside so they could blend in with evil spirits. And you're probably noticing at this point that Samhain sure has a lot in common with Halloween. The jack-o'-lanterns, the costumes, the association with death and magic, the fact that it starts on October 31st. Well, I'm sure it won't be a surprise to you that through a certain amount of Christian influence on Ireland, Samhain would eventually become Halloween. You see, whenever Christians moved into predominantly pagan countries, they wouldn't try to stomp out their beliefs and practices completely. Rather, they'd absorb elements from them and make them their own. This made it a lot easier to get the people native to these pagan lands to convert to Christianity. An example of this occurring could be found around the year 609 when the Christians invented a new holiday called All Saints Day to honor the saints and placed it on May 13th, the same day as Lemuria, a Roman pagan festival where unwanted spirits were banished from people's homes. Due to the added pressure of Christian rulers like Emperor Theodosius putting laws into place that ordered the celebration of Christian holidays and outlawed pagan ones, Roman citizens had no choice but to give up their old beliefs once and for all. Then when the Christians realized their plan to drain the life out of Lemuria was successful, they wanted to do the same thing to Samhain over in Ireland. So sometime before the 8th century, they moved All Saints Day to November 1st, called it All Hallows Day, and called the day before, October 31st, Hallows Eve and that eventually became Halloween. But it wasn't until the 1840s when Irish immigrants started coming to America in droves and bringing their traditions with them that jack-o'-lanterns took the final form that we know today. Because remember how originally they were carved out of turnips and potatoes? Of course you do. How could you forget?
Well, when the Irish got to America, they found that pumpkins, a fruit they didn't know existed because it was exclusive to the Western Hemisphere, and yes, I said fruit, made even better jack-o'-lanterns. And while we may carve jack-o'-lanterns for different reasons nowadays, mostly for fun and not self-defense, it's still an awesome tradition that people have only gotten better at as time has gone on. And who knows, maybe they do offer protective magic of some kind. To be safe, I would just advise any super cool teenagers who think they're gonna make pumpkin smashing the next TikTok trend not to do that unless they want Stingy Jack coming back to pull their face out their butt. Speaking of Stingy Jack, we've still got one more story about him to cover and he's even more savage in this iteration than the last one. So if you're squeamish, maybe now's a good time to get off the ride. This variant of the Stingy Jack story was published in a penny dreadful called the Dublin Penny Journal on January 16th, 1936. So not exactly close to Halloween season. For those who don't know, penny dreadfuls were cheap little magazines a dozen or so pages long that told stories about criminals, detectives, supernatural entities, topics that are still incredibly popular to this day, especially in podcast and documentary format. The reason for their name was that they only cost a penny, but the cheap entertainment didn't mean it was low quality. Legendary characters like Sweeney Todd and Sexton Blake were both born from Penny Dreadfuls. This particular story, called Jack of the Lantern, was written by an unknown author whose initials were E.W., and it starts out similar to every other Stingy Jack story. We're introduced to this character who's a bit of a head, and while he's drunkenly stumbling home from whatever hole he crawled out of, he discovers a concerning scene. While crossing a ford that was associated with tales of murder and superstition, he hears a voice cry out, For the love of heaven, take me to some human habitation for I am no tortured spirit, but a poor homeless wanderer who may have lost my way on the wild moor and have lain down here to die, for I durst not cross the rapid water. So may mercy be shown to you in your hour of need and in the day of your distress. Initially, Jack thought this was a trick being played by some demon, but when he summoned the courage to follow the voice and found a battered and bruised wanderer dying in the ford, he was so relieved that it wasn't an evil spirit that he actually humanized the poor guy. For maybe the first time ever in his life, Stingy wanted to do some good so he threw the wanderer onto his horse and brought him to his house. Naturally, Jack's wife was surprised to see her husband bringing in someone who needed their help, but she was excited for the company, and together they cleaned the old wanderer up, gave him some new clothes, some food, and a warm bed, then they went to sleep as well. The next morning, Jack woke up to a blazing bright light, and where the wanderer once stood was an angel in his place, and to repay Jack for his generosity, he offered to bless his household and grant him any three wishes he wanted. Now, this is where the Trixie Jack that were accustomed him to makes his return. He wishes that anyone who touches his sycamore tree in the front yard will be stuck to it until he releases them, for the same rule to apply to his favorite chair, and yet again for the rule to apply to his toolbox. After hearing these wishes that were all motivated by petty revenge, the angel let out an audible sigh and granted them, but the powers in heaven had decided right there that Jack would never be allowed in. He had the opportunity to wish for so much good, but instead chose to punish those who wronged him. Nevertheless, the angel's blessing did stay on his house, so he had many children and every harvest was bountiful. 20 years later, a demon came to collect the devil's due, but as we know at this point, Jack doesn't do anything he doesn't want to. So he told the demon to have a seat in his favorite chair while he left to go put on his Sunday best. Then when the demon finds it can't get up, Jack returns to the room with a flail and uses it to beat the hell out of the hell spawn until every bone in its body is broken and it's begging for mercy. Jack says he'll only let the demon go if it promises that it will leave him alone, and the monster has no choice but to agree so it can return back to hell. But when Satan finds out that one of his best messengers was bloodied and broken, he sends an even more vicious minion in its place. When the new demon shows up the next day, Jack says, fine, I'll come with you, but if we're gonna walk the road to hell, you've gotta let me fix my shoe. Hand me that mallet from my toolbox. So when the demon obliges, it ends up stuck to the toolbox, which is stuck to the wall. Once again, Jack breaks out the flail and brings it down on the demon's bones without mercy. With every swing, he hears another limb split or snap until finally he releases his victim and it returns to hell. On the third day, Satan decides against wasting another one of his loyal servants and takes it upon himself to collect Jack. He shows up outside his door and says it's time to get going, but Jack insists that he can't make the trip without his walking stick. 
stick. Initially, Satan tries arguing with him, saying it's not necessary, but Jack isn't afraid to make himself look really pathetic to get what he wants. So Satan walks over to the sycamore tree to break off a stick, and what do you know, he gets stuck to it. At this, Jack yelps for joy because he just outsmarted the final boss. He runs inside, grabs his favorite flail, plus two more, and proceeds to break all of them over Satan's head while he's begging for mercy. Then Jack cuts a deal with the devil. He agrees to let him go if he promises he won't ever come back or send one of his messengers to collect him. And left with no other choice, Satan agrees. But while Jack may have outsmarted the demons down below, death itself is a part of nature, so he couldn't defend himself from its assault. And you already know the rest of the story. When his soul showed up at the gates of hell, they wouldn't open. In this version, Satan actually ran and hid out of fear that Jack would see him and heaven basically laughed in his face when he tried to get in. Being unfit for either meant Jack was cursed to spend eternity in purgatory, walking the earth shrouded in darkness with nothing but a glowing ember and a hollowed out husk to light his way. And that solo fam is the story of Jack of the Lantern and the messed up origins of Jack o' Lantern. So now I've got to say thanks to the sponsor who made this episode possible, Squarespace. If you're watching a video on the origins of jack-o'-lanterns, chances are you've carved a few in your lifetime, which means you know it's a pretty simple process. Cut open the head, pull out the guts, carve its face, throw a candle in there, and you're good to go. Well, what if I told you that building a website is now as simple as carving a jack-o'-lantern? probably wouldn't believe me, but all you've got to do to see for yourself is try out Squarespace. The process is super simple and straightforward. After answering a short questionnaire detailing what your site is about, you pick a few of your top goals, choose the stage that best describes where you are in your process, and boom! Dozens of templates available at your fingertips that have been tailored to your specific needs. After that, it's up to you to decide what your site features. For example, our website, MessedUpOrigins.com, has links to various playlists, a list of my favorite books to use in my research research complete with affiliate purchase links and a gallery to show off the solo fam's art. On top of all that, they also give you access to a plethora of marketing tools and analytics so you can gauge how much traffic your website is generating, and they have an incredible customer support team that's available 24-7 so even us night owls can get the help we need. Whether you're selling merchandise, showing off your art, starting a blog, or just promoting your already existing business, Squarespace has exactly what you need. It's obviously easy to use, and as a bonus, it's super affordable. So to any Anyone who wants to take a step in the right direction and toward self-actualization, now's your chance. Just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try out the service completely free. Then when your dream project is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase. Thanks, Sponsor John and Solo Fam. Thank you so much for tuning into our first episode of our annual Spoopathon. If you enjoyed today's story and learned yourself something new, consider hitting those like and subscribe buttons because I've got more content like this coming out every single week. That means every week you can learn some new messed up facts to share with your friends and change the way they see the world for better and worse. Those who want to stay updated on messed up origins news and send me suggestions for future topics can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Those are also great backups for when the sub box doesn't want to work. And don't forget to follow Gunther if you want to see what he and Penny's Halloween costume is going to be. Though I'm curious if any of you could actually guess what this is. I'll see you all again next week with another installment of Astrology Explained, and then the week after that with another spoopy episode. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Could you stop grunting, please? We're done. We're done. I filmed for two and a half hours. You filmed for five minutes. I think you'll be okay. Okay. <laughs>